Today in Ancient DOS Games, we're taking a look back at a classic adventure title often forgotten due to its highly unusual nature, but not by fans of this show who have made this one of the top requests over the years, simply titled Loom. This is a game which is a little tricky to comment on for a variety of reasons, so hopefully I can get my thoughts across succinctly over the course of the video, but the thing is, if you've never actually played this game before, then I guarantee you will have no idea what you're in for. Now, any preconceptions you have from seeing screenshots or even watching someone else play the game, just throw them away, because they are very wrong. At its most basic level, Loom is a game about overcoming obstacles. But those obstacles don't derive from getting and using a cavalcade of inventory items. Instead, it's about spell casting. But not just learning spells and choosing the right ones to cast, but determining what the spells even are, and then figuring out if the spell you need is the one you figured out, or if the spell you need is the opposite of what you figured out. And this is also a game born out of a desire to make games more cinematic, a process which is surprisingly difficult to do when limited to an EGA palette without completely breaking the RAM limits of late 80s and early 90s computers. However, when all is said and done, the game is kind of short and also really easy in its standard mode of play. My very first run through the game only took me a little over two and a half hours, and given how very linear the story is, there's not a lot of reasons to go back and play it over and over, though care has been taken to at least try to add some level of replayability, and those aspects will come up over the course of this video. Loom came out on a plethora of systems, but for the DOS version specifically, it was developed by Lucasfilm Games, and they first published it in 1990, prior to their name change to LucasArts. However, they developed a CD-enhanced remake not long following, which came out in 1992. Either way though, it's effectively a one-player adventure game. The original release of the game primarily supports CGA 4 color, Tandy 16 color, and EGA 16 color graphics, running at 320x200 resolution, but also has support for MCGA and VGA just as a matter of compatibility, never using more than 16 colors in either mode, while the remake exclusively runs in VGA 320x200 with 256 color graphics. As for audio, the original release supports AdLib, the CMS, the PC speaker, and Tandy 3 voice chipsets, while a patch was offered not long following to add Roland MT32 support, though be aware any copies of the original game you get will not have that by default. The remake on the other hand is fascinating in that all of its audio, every single bit of it, is done with a single long CD audio track which seeks to specific time codes for each sound effect or piece of music or dialogue, which means so long as you've got a CD audio support through whatever sound device you have set up, you're good to go. As for this game's release date, oh boy. So, it's still commercial and presently the easiest way to acquire and play the game nowadays on modern hardware is to purchase a digital copy of the game from GOG or Steam, either of which will run you $6. However, either way you're only getting the VGA remake, not the original game, and you're also not getting the files necessary to run the game on a real DOS machine as it's being emulated through ScumVM. I mean, the files are technically there, but to keep file sizes down, the CD audio track has been compressed down into some other file format I don't recognize. So you could play it on real hardware, but with no audio whatsoever. And given the nature of this game, you basically need audio to play it. Playing this game on mute is not an option. So that brings us around to physical releases, and unfortunately, this is one of the few DOS games which has ended up in speculator hell. People routinely trading the game in sealed or fully boxed condition for hundreds of dollars claiming it to be extremely rare and thus worth the insane price point. When truth be told, I came up with about 30 copies for sale on eBay alone just from doing a cursory search. The original game is not even remotely rare and the sale prices make no sense at all. Well, I mean, they kind of make a little sense when you realize that the original release of the game also came with an audio cassette featuring a 30 minute audio drama detailing the backstory of the game, but even when that cassette is missing, the prices are still loony. So yeah, trying to get the original game anymore is dumb and stupid, and since I already own a copy of the remake, I figured I'd just grab a less legitimate copy of the original and listen to the audio drama on YouTube. 
And speaking of the remake, there's far fewer copies of it floating around, yet the prices are at least a little more sane, typically going for between $20 and $60 for a loose CD in its jewel case. Now, this may all seem somewhat trivial, complaining about it being way easier to get the remake compared to the original game, but we're going to have some words about that later in the video. Suffice to say, if you've ever gone looking into this game and wondered why so many people say to play the EGA version and not the remake, they have their reasons and they're not unfounded. So despite being a highly cinematic game, Loom's biggest weakness is actually its story. And not that the story isn't interesting, but rather, it doesn't feel like it's grounded. You know how some people will refer to a bad story seeming like it's being made up as they go along, to infer that it didn't feel planned out in any way? Yeah, that's what Loom's story feels like, but with enough intrigue to make it interesting despite not ever getting its bearings straight. Also, before I summarize the backstory, one kick in the balls I should point out right away is that the GOG and Steam releases, despite being the remake, include the manuals for the original release of the game, which explicitly says in bold text to quote, listen to the audio drama, end quote, which is not included, thus the digital re-releases are already off to a great start. Anyways, the backstory tells of a world, possibly Earth's distant future, where humans have divided themselves up into a plethora of guilds, each suited to crafting their particular specialty, but one of these guilds is that of the Weavers, mysterious folk who are always adorned in cloaks which prevent seeing their faces, who are able to use magical, musical drafts to alter the threads of fate and change the world around them in some manner. They also maintain a massive loom which weaves the fate of the world and their magic interacts with the loom to create long tapestries to indicate what's going on. And yeah, even when you're listening to the audio drama, it really doesn't make a lot of sense how the physical loom and the weavers and the world are all somehow interconnected. So let's just pretend that they are and get on with it. Now, because the elders of the Guild of Weavers are incredibly dead set on not allowing their powers to be used to make the world better, one such guild member, known as Signa Threadbear, decides to use her magic on the loom, in defiance of the elders, to attempt to change the fate of the world to try and do something to make everything better. The elders do catch her in the act, but it's too late. Her new threads are spun, and the result is a brand new baby boy. Yet the irony's not lost on me that a fatherless birth is a plot point in more than one thing to come out of Lucasfilm. Anyways, the elders quickly decide that they need to punish Signa for altering the destiny of the world, thus she entrusts the care of her new child to Dame Hetchel, an old member of the guild lacking the same ambitions of the elders, while the elders weave a new draft into Signa's fate, which ends up transforming her into a swan, who then flies away, only returning once a year on the same day to witness how her son is doing. The boy is given the name Bobbin Threadbear by Dame Hetchel, and as he grows up, he's shunned by nearly everyone around him, except Hetchel. In fact, the guild refuses to teach him anything about weaving, as the thread left in the loom by Cygnus seems to indicate that all will be thrown into chaos, and does the elders worry that if Bobbin learns anything about weaving, he'll use those powers to destroy the world. In secret, though, Dame Hetchel is teaching Bobbin the very basics of weaving, and on the eve of reaching his age of maturity, on his 17th birthday, both Bobbin and Hetchel are summoned by the elders of the guild to decide on Bobbin's fate, thus bringing us into the start of the game proper. Also, before I get into the gameplay itself, I want to quickly address a question sent in by one of my Patreon supporters, Simone Vahainen, who asks, can you think of any obvious sources of inspiration for the musical spellcasting system, or would this have been a first of its kind? While I can't think of any specific examples which predate Loom, I highly doubt using music for spellcasting was an unheard of literary concept up to now. Heck, from what I've read, the inspiration for the game primarily just came from seeing the word Loom describing an add-in computer card in a magazine, and they wanted to see what kind of story they could come up with based on that word. Which kind of explains a lot when you think about it. Before you begin playing Loom, you're asked to select a difficulty between three options, Standard, Practice, and Expert. Standard mode is the standard method of play. Practice mode keeps the notes for the last draft heard on screen for you to reference. 
while Expert removes the visual component from all notes played except for the ones you play yourself, which greatly ramps up the difficulty depending on how good of an ear you have for musical notes. An important point here too is that you may think once you've memorized all the drafts in the game, this wouldn't matter anymore, except one of those replayability aspects is that many of the drafts, though not all of them, have one of three possible variants chosen at random when the game begins. So while you can still memorize what you have to do to win, you still have to go through the motions to make sure you're playing the right notes when you need to. Expert also adds some very brief extra cutscene stuff near the end, if you're so inclined. In any event, once the initial moments of the game play out, Bobbin finds himself alone with the die staff of one of the elders, and must now try to figure out where everyone's gone by finding a way to adventure off the island. The die staff and weaving musical drafts is the primary mechanic of the game, and when you first start out, you can only play a low C, D, and E notes, using the upper row of alpha keys on the keyboard much the same way as a piano. Heck, if you're used to using a typing keyboard to play notes in music tracking software or modern audio suites, then everything lines up exactly as you'd expect, with a low C on the Q key, moving up the notes as you move across the top row, reaching high C on the I key. Now, if you happen to have an AZERT keyboard, though, instead of a QWERTY keyboard, I have no idea if the game is prepared to deal with that or not. Interacting with objects isn't completely straightforward, though, and while it's not difficult, it can be a little tricky to adapt to. But the way it works is that clicking on the screen will try to move Bobbin to whatever position seems the most logical given where you clicked and where Bobbin can move to, highlighting an object will show a close-up of it in the bottom right corner, Clicking on the object will have Bobbin move up to the object and then relay what exactly it is, while at the same time selecting it so that you can perform drafts on it. Double clicking on an object will attempt to interact with it directly, and then attempting to click on anything else will end Bobbin's focus on whatever you last clicked on, though highlighting other objects won't work again until Bobbin stops moving following a click. Yeah, it's a little weird how this all works, seeing as the only way to lose your focus on an object so you can scan around for more objects is to move Bobbin elsewhere and then wait for that movement to end, but it's not a deal breaker by any stretch. Now, learning the musical drafts you'll need to solve the various puzzles of the game isn't all that hard either. In fact, the game is intentionally designed to just flat out give you the notes you'll need though often much sooner than when you actually need them, thus you won't always understand what a particular draft might do when you first acquire it, especially if the draft uses a note which you don't yet have access to, as you gain new notes on the die staff any time you complete specific points of progression through the story. Heck, you don't even learn the last note, the high C, until the very end of the game. However, when you learn a particular draft, it's important to pay attention to if it's symmetrical or not. If the first note matches the final note, and the second note matches the third, then the draft will have only one effect, which cannot be reversed. However, any draft which is not symmetrical can be played backwards to have the opposite effect. For instance, the very first draft you learn is opening, yet if you play it backwards, it can be used to close something instead. One of the very next drafts you learn is the dying draft, which turns things green. But if you play it backwards, it will instead remove the color from something. A funny thing about this is that the game has quite a large number of interactive objects you can use drafts on, which serve no purpose to the story whatsoever. For instance, when you get the draft of dying, you can change the white sheets into green, or the green sheets back to white, but none of this matters at all, and there's lots of instances of this happening throughout the game. Now, as you go further and further into the game, the difficulty of the puzzles never really gets much harder, but you start building up quite the collection of drafts. In fact, one of the things included with the original game was a physical book of patterns, which not only serves as copy protection and provides flavor text for all of the drafts, but also has spots where you can write down the drafts as you learn them. Now, this is why the game itself doesn't track any of this, and even the practice mode only tracks the last draft heard, not all of them. Because of this, you really do need to keep something handy to write stuff down while playing through this game. Not to mention, again, because the drafts are randomly chosen with each run, writing them down in the actual book of patterns 
would only really work out the first time through, and then you either wouldn't be able to ever do it that way again, or I'd have to go erase everything you wrote down. Although speaking of the Book of Patterns, one of the reasons why the game feels shorter than expected is because many of the drafts in it simply aren't ever used. And I'm not going to list all of the unused drafts because I don't really want to spoil too much, but a couple of the ones I was surprised never came up over the course of the game include Waterproofing and Extinguishing as their descriptions very much suggest a myriad of solutions to adventure game puzzles, and yet you never learn them. One particular draft though, which technically is in the game, but you never get to weave it yourself, is Summoning, as this is the draft which created the messenger nymph sent to fetch Bobbin at the start of the game. As per usual with narrative-driven adventure titles, I don't really have a lot more to go into in terms of game functionality, as there really is nothing more to say about it. But there is still one very important thing I would be remiss not to discuss when it comes to this game. I've never known them to weave such a bright messenger nymph. I wonder why the elders want to see me. I'd better get down to the village. So another one of my Patreon supporters, Pete Spicer, chimed in with a bunch of info, but the most pertinent thing he said was, the PC VGA talkie is considered the most inferior of the three. And he is not wrong, but it would be a good idea to go into the details as to why it's so inferior, and why every fan of this game recommends against playing the remake, with the third version he was referring to being the FM Towns version. First, let's get some technical details out of the way. The remake is nearly the exact same game logic script as the original, just using an updated version of the Scum engine. But because of the addition of uncompressed CD-based audio, the dialogue has been altered significantly, since all of it, plus the sound and music, had to fit within the physical space of a CD, which, including the 5 megabytes of game data, tops out at just a little under 74 minutes. A couple of that with the fact that the audio drama wasn't included with this release either, and suddenly the initial moments of the game make even less sense in terms of everything going on. Now, there's no denying that the updated graphics are well done, but they definitely don't feel like they were done by the same people with the same attention to detail. Uh, just to give an example, when you reach the Guild of Glassblowers in the original game, you get this massive spanning view of their colony, which includes a graveyard situated in the lower right dome, which you can see through the dome to some extent. Because again, it's all glass. In the remake though, this translucent dome, despite still looking like glass and still looking transparent, now looks empty from the outside. It's time to leave this island, Loom Child. Your destiny lies beyond the sunset, across the sea. Another feature that's sort of cut, but also sort of not, are the close-ups. In the original game, any time a particular person has a lot to say, you get a close-up of their face, which will change expressions as their dialogue continues, giving you an idea of their disposition. Virtually all of these close-ups are cut from the remake, but some were actually added. And again, at the Guild of Glassblowers is this sort of semi-close-up when you eavesdrop on a particular conversation, which in the original didn't have this close-up at all. So yeah, the remake is worse at telling the story and has less attention to detail, thus why so many fans have been trying to get the original included with digital downloads of this game in the future, along with the audio drama. But that hasn't really happened yet. However, despite those shortcomings, the voice acting in the remake is on point and done exceptionally well given what they had to work with. So if there's one thing the remake did right, it's that. And just what do you think you're doing up here? I... I'm not sure. I just rang the bell and well, I... Well, I'm sorry, but you're not supposed to be here. Step back under the lens, please. This is a restricted area. No visitors allowed. Overall, Loom is an interesting experience which is exactly what the devs were originally aiming for. Make something that anyone of any level of skill could find their way through and experience in its entirety. The graphics are also some of the best you'll ever find on 16 color EGA, which wouldn't have been possible if they didn't figure out a way to compress down dithered graphics in a suitable manner. The audio is decent, given its ad-lib limitations, though probably sounds way more impressive with the appropriate MT32 patch and hardware, and the story, uh, it's entertaining, but it's really short, somewhat pointless, and very convoluted within the scope of its own logic. Not to mention, kind of fatalistic. And that's not really everybody's cup of tea. 
I should point out too, there's a bit of gruesomeness near the end of the original game, which was cut from the remake. So that's another thing to keep in mind when deciding if you want to try this game out for yourself or not. Unfortunately, I couldn't figure out how to get the mouse cursor to stop flickering in DOSBox, as nothing I tried seemed to fix it. But in terms of the gameplay itself, you need to set a fixed cycles count of about 10,000. This technically makes one and only one thing in the game play out blazing fast right near the start, but everything else will otherwise be timed out perfectly fine. Your other option, of course, is to use ScumVM. In fact, that's your only option with the digital copies available online at the moment. But then here's the thing. While I don't advocate for software piracy, I'm not blind to the software preservation side of things either. In the case of this game, if not for the pirates, the EGA original would be trapped in speculator hell, where you either shell out hundreds of dollars to play it, or you end up stuck with the inferior remake for six bucks, and yet when it comes down to it, the two different versions are incredibly similar to each other in terms of raw gameplay. Same engine, same game logic script, they're effectively identical games under the hood, just with different assets playing everything out. Thus, I am completely okay with the logic of buying the digital copy of the remake, followed by downloading a less legitimate copy of the original and playing that instead. Which is precisely what I did in terms of putting this video together. Now, with any luck, GOG or Steam will be able to get the original game included in digital copies in the future, though really, I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. Anywho, that'll be all for this episode of Ancient DOS Games. As per usual, I'll be taking time off from making videos for almost the entirety of December, which includes the new No Nostalgia Retro Gaming series, with the last Double Energy video before my break being on Wednesday, November 29th. ADG will resume in 2024 with episode 321 on Saturday, January 4th, while No Nostalgia Retro Gaming will resume right after Christmas on Wednesday, December 27th. Many thanks go out to everyone watching my shows, whether you've been around since the very beginning in 2010, or only just found my stuff 20 minutes ago. And I hope all of you have a great holiday season and continue to enjoy the videos I put together as we dive headfirst into 2024. Until then, see you all later. Thanks for watching everyone, and extra special thanks to everyone supporting me over on Patreon. If you'd also like to support the show directly and get some extra perks, then head on over to patreon.com slash k-a-s-i-c-k.